Chapter One of Impressions of Theophrastus Such. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Middledorf. Daily Inspiration.org. Impressions of Theophrastus Such by George Eliot. Chapter One Looking Inward. It is my habit to give an account to myself of the characters I meet with. Can I give any true account of my own? I am a bachelor, without domestic distractions of any sort, and have all my life been an attentive companion to myself, flattering my nature agreeably on plausible occasions, reviling it rather bitterly when it mortified me, and in general remembering its doings and sufferings with the tenacity which is too apt to raise surprise, if not disgust, at the careless inaccuracy of my acquaintances, who impute to me opinions I never held, express their desire to convert me to my favorite ideas, forget whether I have ever been to the East, and are capable of being three several times astonished at my never having told them before of my accident in the Alps, causing me the nervous shock which has ever since notably diminished my digestive powers. Surely I ought to know myself better than these indifferent outsiders can know me, nay, better even than my intimate friends, to whom I have never breathed those items of my inward experience which have chiefly shaped my life. Yet I have often been forced into the reflection that even the acquaintances who are as forgetful of my biography and tenets as they would be if I were a dead philosopher, are probably aware of certain points in me which may not be included in my most active suspicion. We sing an exquisite passage out of tune, and innocently repeat it for the greater pleasure of our hearers. Who can be aware of what his foreign accent is in the ears of a native, and how can a man be conscious of that dull perception which causes him to mistake altogether what will make him agreeable to a particular woman, and to persevere eagerly in a behavior which she is privately recording against him? I have had some confidences from my female friends as to their opinion of other men whom I have observed trying to make themselves amiable, and it has occurred to me that though I can hardly be so blundering as lippus in the rest of those mistaken candidates for favor whom i have seen ruining their chance by a too elaborate personal canvas i must still come under the common fatality of mankind and share the liability to be absurd without knowing that i am absurd it is in the nature of foolish reasoning to seem good to the foolish reasoner Hence, with all possible study of myself, with all possible effort to escape from the pitiable illusion which makes men laugh, shriek, or curl the lip at folly's likeness, in total unconsciousness that it resembles themselves, I am obliged to recognize that while there are secrets in me unguessed by others, these others have certain items of knowledge about the extent of my powers and the figure I make with them, which in turn are secrets unguessed by me. When I was a lad, I danced a hornpipe with arduous scrupulosity, and while suffering pangs of pallid shyness, was yet proud of my superiority as a dancing pupil, imagining for myself a high place in the estimation of beholders. But I can now picture the amusement they had in the incongruity of my solemn face and ridiculous legs. What sort of hornpipe am I dancing now? Thus, if I laugh at you, O oh fellow men, if I trace with curious interest your labyrinthine self-delusions, note the inconsistencies in your zealous adhesions, and smile at your helpless endeavors in a rashly chosen part, it is not that I feel myself aloof from you. The more intimately I seem to discern your weaknesses, the stronger to me is the proof that I share them. How otherwise could I get the discernment? For even what we are averse to, what we vow not to entertain, must have shaped or shadowed itself within us as a possibility before we can think of exorcising it. No man can know his brother 
simply as a spectator. Dear blunderers, I am one of you. I wince at the fact, but I am not ignorant of it, that I, too, am laughable on unsuspected occasions. Nay, in the very tempest and whirlwind of my anger, I include myself under my own indignation. If the human race has a bad reputation, I perceive that I cannot escape being compromised, and thus, while I carry in myself the key to other men's experience, it is only by observing others that I can so far correct my self-ignorance as to arrive at the certainty that I am liable to commit myself unawares and to manifest some incompetency which I know no more of than the blind man knows of his image in the glass. Is it then possible to describe oneself at once faithfully and fully? In all autobiography there is, nay, ought to be, an incompleteness which may have the effect of falsity. We are, each of us, bound to reticence by the piety we owe to those who have been nearest to us and have had a mingled influence over our lives, by the fellow-feeling which should restrain us from turning our volunteered and picked confessions into an act of accusation against others who have no chance of vindicating themselves, and most of all by that reverence for the higher efforts of our common nature which commands us to bury its lowest fatalities, its invincible remnants of the brute, its most agonizing struggles with temptation in unbroken silence. But the incompleteness which comes of self-ignorance may be compensated by self-betrayal. A man who is affected to tears in dwelling on the generosity of his own sentiments makes me aware of several things not included under those terms. Who has sinned more against those three duteous reticences than Jean-Jacques? Yet half our impressions of his character come not from what he means to convey, but from what he unconsciously enables us to discern. This naive veracity of self-presentation is attainable by the slenderest talent on the most trivial occasions. The least lucid and impressive of orators may be perfectly successful in showing us the weak points of his grammar. Hence, I too may be so far like Jean-Jacques as to communicate more than I am aware of. I am not, indeed, writing an autobiography or pretending to give an unreserved description of myself, but only offering some slight confessions in an apologetic light to indicate that if, in my absence, you dealt as freely with my unconscious weaknesses as I have dealt with the unconscious weaknesses of others, I should not feel myself warranted by common sense in regarding your freedom of observation as an exceptional case of evil speaking, or as malignant interpretation of a character which really offers no handle to just objection, or even as an unfair use for your amusement of disadvantages which, since they are mine, should be regarded with more than ordinary tenderness. Let me at least try to feel myself in the ranks with my fellow men. It is true that I would rather not hear either your well-founded ridicule or your judicious strictures, though not averse to finding fault with myself and conscious of deserving lashes. I like to keep the scourge in my own discriminating hand. I never felt myself sufficiently meritorious to like being hated as a proof of my superiority or so thirsty for improvement as to desire that all my acquaintances should give me their candid opinion of me. I really do not want to learn from my enemies. I prefer having none to learn from. Instead of being glad when men use me despitefully, I wish they would behave better and find a more amiable occupation for their intervals of business. In brief, after a close intimacy with myself for longer period than I choose to mention, I find within me a permanent longing for approbation, sympathy, and love. Yet I am a bachelor, and the person I love best has never loved me or known that I loved her. <laughs>
though continually in society and caring about the joys and sorrows of my neighbours i feel myself so far as my personal lot is concerned uncared for and alone your own fault my dear fellow said minutius felix one day that i had incautiously mentioned this uninteresting fact and he was right in sense as other than he had intended why should i expect to be admired and have my company doted upon i have done no services to my country beyond those of every peaceable orderly citizen and as to intellectual contribution my only published work was a failure so that i am spoken of to inquiring beholders as the author of a book you have probably not seen the work was a humorous romance unique in its kind and i am told is much tasted in a cherokee translation where the jokes are rendered with all the serious eloquence characteristic of the red races this sort of distinction as a writer nobody is likely to have read can hardly counteract an indistinctness in my articulation which the best intentioned loudness will not remedy then in some quarters my awkward feet are against me the length of my upper lip an inveterate way i have of walking with my head foremost my chin projecting one can become only too well aware of such things by looking in the glass or in that other mirror held up to nature in the frank opinions of street boys or of our free people travelling by excursion train and no doubt they account for the half-suppressed smiles which i have observed on some fair faces when i have been presented before them this direct perceptive judgment is not to be argued against but i am tempted to remonstrate when the physical points i have mentioned are apparently taken to warrant unfavourable inferences concerning my mental quickness with all the increasing uncertainty which modern progress has thrown over the relations of mind and body it seems tolerably clear that wit cannot be seated in the upper lip and that the balance of the haunches in walking has nothing to do with the subtle discrimination of ideas yet strangers evidently do not expect me to make a clever observation and my good things are as unnoticed as if they were anonymous pictures i have indeed had the mixed satisfaction of finding that when they were appropriated by some one else they were found remarkable and even brilliant it is to be borne in mind that i am not rich have neither stud nor cellar and no very high connection such as give to a look of imbecility a certain prestige of inheritance through a titled line just as the austrian lip confers a grandeur of historical associations on a kind of feature which might make us reject an advertising footman i have now and then done harm to a good cause by speaking for it in public and have discovered too late that my attitude on the occasion would more suitably have been that of negative beneficence is it really to the advantage of an opinion that i should be known to hold it and as to the force of my arguments that is a secondary consideration with audiences who have given a new scope to the ex pede herculum principle and from awkward feet infer awkward fallacies once when zeal lifted me on my legs i distinctly heard an enlightened artisan remark here's a rum cut and doubtless he reasoned in the same way as the elegant glycera when she politely puts on an air of listening to me but elevates her eyebrows and chills her glance in sign of predetermined neutrality both have their reasons for judging the quality of my speech beforehand this sort of reception to a man of affectionate disposition who has also the innocent vanity of desiring to be agreeable has naturally a depressing if not embittering tendency and in early life i began to seek for some consoling point of view some warrantable method of softening the hard peas i had to walk on some comfortable fanaticism which might supply the needed self-satisfaction at one time i dwelt much on the idea of compensation 
trying to believe that I was all the wiser for my bruised vanity, that I had the higher place in the true spiritual scale, and even that a day might come when some visible triumph would place me in the French heaven of having the laughers on my side. But I presently perceived that this was a very odious sort of self-cajolery. Was it in the least true that I was wiser than several of my friends who made an excellent figure and were perhaps praised a little beyond their merit? Is the ugly, unready man in the corner, outside the current of conversation, really likely to have a fairer view of things than the agreeable talker whose success strikes the unsuccessful as a repulsive example of forwardness and conceit? And as to compensation in future years, would the fact that I myself got it reconcile me to an order of things in which I could see a multitude with as bad a share as mine who, instead of getting their corresponding compensation, were getting beyond the reach of it in old age? What could be more contemptible than the mood of mind which makes a man measure the justice of divine or human law by the agreeableness of his own shadow and the ample satisfaction of his own desires. I dropped a form of consolation which seemed to be encouraging me in the persuasion that my discontent was the chief evil in the world and my benefit the soul of good in that evil. May there not be at least a partial release from the imprisoning verdict that a man's philosophy is the formula of his personality. In certain branches of science we can ascertain our personal equation, the measure of difference between our judgments and an average standard. May there not be some corresponding correction of our personal partialities in moral theorizing? If a squint or other ocular defect disturbs my vision, I can get instructed in the fact, be made aware that my condition is abnormal, and either through spectacles or diligent imagination, I can learn the average appearance of things. Is there no remedy or corrective for that inward squint which consists in a dissatisfied egoism or other want of mental balance? In my conscience, I saw that the bias of personal discontent was just as misleading and odious as the bias of self-satisfaction. Whether we look through the rose-colored glass or the indigo, we are equally far from the hues which the healthy human eye beholds in heaven above and earth below. I began to dread ways of consoling which were really a flattering of native illusions, a feeding up into monstrosity of an inward growth already disproportionate, to get an especial scorn for that scorn of mankind which is a transmuted disappointment of preposterous claims to watch with peculiar alarm, lest what I called my philosophic estimate of the human lot in general should be a mere prose lyric expressing my own pain and subsequent bad temper. The standing ground worth striving after seems to be some delectable mountain whence I could see things in proportions as little as possible determined by that self-partiality which certainly plays a necessary part in our bodily sustenance but has a starving effect on the mind. Thus, I finally gave up any attempt to make out that I preferred cutting a bad figure and that I liked to be despised because in this way I was getting more virtuous than my successful rivals. And I have long looked with suspicion on all views which are recommended as peculiarly consolatory to wounded vanity or other personal disappointments. The consolations of egoism are simply a change of attitude or a resort to a new kind of diet which soothes and fattens it. Fed in this way, it is apt to become a monstrous spiritual pride or a chuckling satisfaction that the final balance will not be against us, but against those who now eclipse us. Examining the world in order to find consolation is very much like looking carefully over the pages of a great book in order to find our own name. 
if not in the text, at least in a laudatory note. Whether we find what we want or not, our preoccupation has hindered us from a true knowledge of the contents. But an attention fixed on the main theme or various matter of the book would deliver us from that slavish subjection to our own self-importance. And I had the mighty volume of the world before me. Nay, I had the struggling action of a myriad lives around me, each single life as dear to itself as mine to me. Was there no escape here from the stupidity of a murmuring self-occupation? Clearly enough, if anything hindered my thought from rising to the force of passionately interested contemplation, or my poor pent-up pond of sensitiveness from widening into a beneficent river of sympathy, it was my own dullness. And though I could not make myself the reverse of shallow all at once, I had at least learned where I had better turn my attention. Something came of this alteration in my point of view, though I admit that the result is of no striking kind. It is unnecessary for me to utter modest denials, since none have assured me that I have a vast intellectual scope, or, what is more surprising, considering I have done so little, that I might, if I chose, surpass any distinguished man whom they wish to deprecate. I have not attained any lofty peak of magnanimity, nor would I trust beforehand in my capability of meeting a severe demand for moral heroism. But that I have at least succeeded in establishing a habit of mind which keeps watch against my self-partiality and promotes a fair consideration of what touches the feelings or the fortunes of my neighbors seems to be proved by the ready confidence with which men and women appeal to my interest in their experience. It is gratifying to one who would, above all things, avoid the insanity of fancying himself a more momentous or touching object than he really is, to find that nobody expects from him the least sign of such mental aberration, and that he is evidently held capable of listening to all kinds of personal outpourings without the least disposition to become communicative in the same way. This confirmation of the hope that my bearing is not that of the self-flattering lunatic is given me in ample measure. My acquaintances tell me unreservedly of their triumphs and their peaks, explain their purposes at length, and reassure me with cheerfulness as to their chances of success insist on their theories and accept me as a dummy with whom they rehearse their side of future discussions, unwind their coiled-up griefs in relation to their husbands, or recite to me examples of feminine incomprehensibility as typified in their wives, mention frequently the fair applause which their merits have wrung from some person, and the attacks to which certain oblique motives have stimulated others. At the time when I was less free from superstition about my own power of charming, I occasionally, in the glow of sympathy which embraced me and my confiding friend on the subject of his dissatisfaction or resentment, was urged to hint at a corresponding experience in my own case. But the signs of a rapidly lowering pulse and spreading nervous depression in my previously vivacious interlocutor warned me that I was acting on that dangerous misreading, do as you are done by. Recalling the true version of the golden rule, I could not wish that others should lower my spirits as I was lowering my friends. After several times obtaining the same result from a like experiment in which all the circumstances were varied except my own personality, I took it as an established inference that these fitful signs of a lingering belief in my own importance were generally felt to be abnormal and were something short of that sanity which I aimed to secure. Clearness on this point is not without its gratifications, as I have said. While my desire to explain myself in private ears has been quelled, the habit of getting interested in the experience of others has been continually gathering strength and I am really at the point of finding that this world would be worth living in without any lot of one's own. 
is it not possible for me to enjoy the scenery of the earth without saying to myself i have a cabbage garden in it but this sounds like the lunacy of fancying oneself everybody else and being unable to play one's own part decently another form of the disloyal attempt to be independent of the common lot and to live without a sharing of pain perhaps i have made self-betrayals enough already to show that i have not arrived at that non-human independence my conversational reticences about myself termed to garrulousness on paper as the sea lion plunges and swims the more energetically because his limbs are of a sort to make him shambling on land the act of writing in spite of past experience brings with it the vague delightful illusion of an audience nearer to my own idiom than the cherokees and more numerous than the visionary one for whom many authors have declared themselves willing to go through the pleasing punishment of publication my illusion is of a more liberal kind and i imagine a far-off hazy multitudinous assemblage as in a picture of paradise making an approving chorus to the sentences and paragraphs of which i myself particularly enjoyed the writing the haze is a necessary condition if any physiognomy becomes distinct in the foreground it is fatal the countenance is sure to be one bent on discountenancing my innocent intentions it is pale-eyed incapable of being amused when i am amused or indignant at what makes me indignant it stares at my presumption pities my ignorance or is manifestly preparing to expose the various instances in which i unconsciously disgrace myself i shudder at this too corporeal auditor and turn toward another point of the compass where the haze is unbroken why should i not indulge this remaining illusion since i do not take my approving choral paradise as a warrant for setting the press to work again and making some thousand sheets of superior paper unsaleable i leave my manuscripts to a judgment outside my imagination but i will not ask to hear it or request my friends to pronounce before i have been buried decently what he really thinks of my parts and to state candidly whether my papers would be most usefully applied in lighting the cheerful domestic fire it is all too probable that he will be exasperated at the trouble i have given him of reading them but the consequent clearness and vivacity with which he could demonstrate to me that the fault of my manuscripts as of my one published work is simply flatness and not that surpassing subtlety which is the preferable ground of popular neglect this verdict however instructively expressed is a portion of earthly discipline of which i will not beseech my friend to be the instrument other persons i am aware have not the same cowardly shrinking from a candid opinion of their performances and are even importunately eager for it but i have convinced myself in numerous cases that such exposers of their own back to the smiter were of too hopeful a disposition to believe in the scourge and really trusted in a pleasant anointing an outpouring of balm without any previous wounds i am of a less trusting disposition and will only ask my friend to use his judgment in insuring me against posthumous mistake thus i make myself a charter to write and keep the pleasing inspiring illusion of being listened to though i may sometimes write about myself what i have already said on this too familiar theme has been meant only as a preface to show that in noting the weaknesses of my acquaintances i am conscious of my fellowship with them that a gratified sense of superiority is at the root of barbarous laughter may be at least half the truth but there is a loving laughter in which the only recognized superiority is that of the ideal self the god within holding the mirror and the scourge for our own pettiness as well as our neighbors end of chapter one chapter two of impressions of theophrastus such by george eliot this LibriVox recording is in the public domain.
Recording by Josh Middledorf. Chapter 2. Looking Backward Most of us who have had decent parents would shrink from wishing that our father and mother had been somebody else whom we never knew. Yet it is held no impiety, rather a graceful mark of instruction, for a man to wail that he has not the son of another age and another nation, of which also he knows nothing except through the easy process of an imperfect imagination and a flattering fancy. But the period thus looked back on with purely admiring regret, as perfect enough to suit a superior mind, is always a long way off. The desirable contemporaries are hardly nearer than Leonardo da Vinci. Most likely, they are the fellow citizens of Pericles, or, best of all, of the Aeolic lyrists, whose sparse remains suggest a comfortable contrast with our redundance. No impassioned personage wishes he had been born in the age of Pitt, that his ardent youth might have eaten the dearest bread, dressed itself with the longest coat-tails and the shortest waist, or heard the loudest rumbling at the heaviest war-taxes. And it would be really something original in polished verse if one of our young writers declared he would gladly be turned eighty-five, that he might have known the joy and pride of being an Englishman when there were fewer reforms and plenty of highwaymen, fewer discoveries and more faces pitted with the smallpox, when laws were made to keep up the price of corn and the troublesome Irish were more miserable. Three quarters of a century ago is not a distance that lends much enchantment to the view. We are familiar with the average men of that period and are still consciously encumbered with its bad contrivances and mistaken acts. The lords and gentlemen painted by young Lawrence talked and wrote their nonsense in a tongue we thoroughly understand. Hence their times are not much flattered, not much glorified by the yearnings of that modern sect of flagellants who make a ritual of lashing not themselves, but all their neighbors. To me, however, that paternal time, the time of my father's youth, never seemed prosaic, for it came to my imagination first through his memories, which made a wondrous perspective to my little daily world of discovery. And for my part, I call no age absolutely unpoetic. How should it be so, since there are always children to whom the acorns, the swallow's eggs are a wonder? always those human passions and fatalities through which Garrick as Hamlet in Bobwig and Knee Breeches moved his audience more than some have since done in Velvet Tunic and Plume. But every age since the Golden may be made more or less prosaic by minds that attend only to its vulgar and sordid elements, of which there are always an abundance, even in Greece and Italy, the favorite realms of the retrospective optimists. To be quite fair towards the ages, a little ugliness as well as beauty must be allowed to each of them, a little implicit poetry even to those which echoed loudest with servile, pompous, and trivial prose. Such impartiality is not in vogue at present. If we acknowledge our obligation to the ancients, it is hardly to be done without some flouting of our contemporaries, who, with all their faults, must be allowed the merit of keeping the world habitable for the refined eulogists of the blameless past. One wonders whether the remarkable originators who first had the notion of digging wells or of churning for butter, and who were certainly very useful to their own time as well as ours, were left quite free from invidious comparison with predecessors who let the water and the milk alone or whether some rhetorical nomad, as he stretched himself on the grass with a good appetite for contemporary butter, became loud on the virtue of ancestors who were uncorrupted by the produce of the cow. Nay, whether in a high flight of imaginative self-sacrifice, after swallowing the butter, he even wished himself earlier born and already eaten for the sustenance of a generation more naive than his own. I have often had the fool's hectic of wishing about the 
unalterable. But with me that useless exercise has turned chiefly on the conception of a different self, and not, as it usually does in literature, on the advantage of having been born in a different age, and more especially in one where life is imagined to have been altogether majestic and graceful. With my present abilities, external proportions, and generally small provision for ecstatic enjoyment, where is the ground for confidence that I should have had a preferable career in such an epoch of society? An age in which every department has its awkward squad seems in my mind's eye to suit me better. I might have wandered by the Strymon under Philip and Alexander without throwing any new light on method or organizing the sum of human knowledge. On the other hand, I might have objected to Aristotle as too much of a systematizer and have preferred the freedom of a little self-contradiction as offering more chances of truth. I gather, too, from the undeniable testimony of his disciple Theophrastus that there were bores, ill-bred persons, and detractors, even in Athens, of species remarkably corresponding to the English and not yet made endurable by being classic and altogether, with my present fastidious nostril, I feel that I am the better off for possessing Athenian life solely as an inodorous fragment of antiquity. As to Sappho's Mytilene, while I am convinced that the lesbian capital held some plain men of middle stature and slow conversational powers, the addition of myself to their number though clad in the majestic folds of hymation and without cravat, would have hardly made a sensation among the accomplished fair ones who were so precise in adjusting their own drapery about their delicate ankles. Whereas, being another sort of person in the present age, I might have given it some needful theoretic clue, or I might have poured forth poetic strains which would have anticipated theory and seemed a voice from the prophetic souls of the wide world dreaming of things to come. Or I might have been one of those benignant, lovely souls who, without astonishing the public and posterity, make a happy difference in the lives close around them, and in this way lift the average of earthly joy. In some form or other I might have been so filled from the store of universal existence that I should have been freed from the empty wishing which is like a child's cry to be inside a golden cloud, its imagination being too ignorant to figure the lining of dimness and dampness. On the whole, though, there is some rash boasting about enlightenment and an occasional insistence on an originality which is that of the present year's corn crop. We seem too much disposed to indulge and to call by complimentary names a greater charity for other portions of the human race than for our contemporaries. All reverence and gratitude for the worthy dead on whose labors we have entered, all care for the future generations whose lot we are preparing, but some affection and fairness for those who are doing the actual work of the world, some attempt to regard them with the same freedom from ill temper, whether on private or public grounds, as we may hope will be felt by those who will call us ancient some day. Otherwise, the looking before and after, which is our grand human privilege, is in danger of turning to a sort of otherworldliness, breeding a more illogical indifference or bitterness than was ever bred by the ascetic's contemplation of heaven. Except on the ground of a primitive golden age and continuous degeneracy, I see no rational footing for scorning the whole present population of the globe, unless I scorn every previous generation from whom they have inherited their diseases of mind and body, and by consequence scorn my own scorn, which is equally an inheritance of mixed ideas and feelings concocted for me in the boiling cauldron of this universally contemptible life, and so on, scorning to infinity. This may represent some actual states of mind, for it is a narrow prejudice of mathematicians to suppose that ways of thinking are to be driven out of the field by being reduced to an absurdity. 
the absurd is taken as an excellent juicy thistle by many constitutions reflections of this sort have gradually determined me not to grumble at the age in which i happen to have been born a natural tendency certainly older than hesiod many ancient beautiful things are lost many ugly modern things have arisen but invert the proposition and it is equally true i at least am a modern with some interest in advocating tolerance and notwithstanding an inborn beguilement which carries my affection and regret continually into an imagined past i am aware that i must lose all sense of moral proportion unless i keep alive a stronger attachment to what is near and a power of admiring what i best know and understand hence this question of wishing to be rid of one's contemporaries associates itself with my filial feeling and calls up the thought that i might as justifiably wish that i had had other parents than those whose loving tones are my earliest memory and whose last parting first taught me the meaning of death i feel bound to quell such a wish as blasphemy besides there are other reasons why i am contented that my father was a country parson born much about the same time as scott and wordsworth notwithstanding certain qualms i have felt at the fact that the property on which i am living was saved out of tithe before the period of commutation and without the provisional transfiguration into a modus it has sometimes occurred to me when i have been taking a slice of excellent ham that from a too tenable point of view i was breakfasting on a small squealing black pig which more than half a century ago was the unwilling representative of spiritual advantages not otherwise acknowledged by the grudging farmer or dairyman who parted with him one enters on a fearful labyrinth in tracing compound interest backward and such complications of thought have reduced the flavour of the ham but since i have nevertheless eaten it the chief effect has been to moderate the severity of my radicalism which was not part of my paternal inheritance and to raise the assuaging reflection that if the pig and the parishioner had been intelligent enough to anticipate my historical point of view they would have seen themselves and the rector in a light that would have made the tithe voluntary notwithstanding such drawbacks i am rather fond of the mental furniture i got by having a father who was well acquainted with all ranks of his neighbours and am thankful that he was not one of those aristocratic clergymen who could not have sat down to a meal with any family in the parish except my lord's still more that he was not an earl or a marquis a chief misfortune of high birth is that it usually shuts a man out from the large sympathetic knowledge of human experience which comes from contact with various classes on their own level and in my father's time that entail of social ignorance had not been disturbed as we see it now to look always from overhead at the crowd of one's fellow-men must be in many ways incapacitating even with the best will and intelligence the serious blunders it must lead to in the effort to manage them for the good one may see clearly by the mistaken ways people take of flattering and enticing those whose associations are unlike their own hence i have always thought that the most fortunate britons are those whose experience has given them a practical share in many aspects of the national lot who have lived long among the mixed commonality roughing it with them under difficulties knowing how their food tastes to them and getting acquainted with their notions and motives not by inference from traditional types and literature or from philosophical theories but from daily fellowship and observation of course such experience is apt to get antiquated and my father might find himself much at a loss among a mixed rural population of the present day but he knew very well what could be wisely expected from the miners the weavers the field labourers and farmers of his own time yes and from the aristocracy for he had been brought up in close contact with them and had been companion to a young nobleman who was deaf and dumb a clergyman lad he used to say to me should feel in himself a bit every class 
and this theory had a felicitous agreement with his inclination and practice which certainly answered in making him beloved by his parishioners they grumbled at their obligations toward him but what then it was natural to grumble at any demand for payment tithe included but also natural for a rector to desire his tithe and look well after the levying a christian pastor who did not mind about his money was not an ideal prevalent among the rural minds of fat central england and might have seemed to introduce a dangerous laxity of supposition about christian laymen who happened to be creditors my father was none the less beloved because he was understood to be of a saving disposition and how could he save without getting his tithe the sight of him was not unwelcome at any door and he was remarkable among the clergy of his district for having no lasting feud with rich or poor in his parish i profited by his popularity and for months after my mother's death when i was a little fellow of nine i was taken care of first at one homestead and then at another a variety which i enjoyed much more than my stay at the hall where there was a tutor afterwards for several years i was my father's constant companion in his outdoor business riding by his side on my little pony and listening to the lengthy dialogues he held with darby or joan the one on the road or in the fields the other outside or inside her door in my earliest remembrance of him his hair was already grey for i was his youngest as well as his only surviving child and it seemed to me that advanced age was appropriate to a father as indeed in all respects i considered him a parent so much to my honour that the mention of my relationship to him was likely to secure me regard among those to whom i was otherwise a stranger my father's stories from his life including so many names of distant persons that my imagination placed no limit to his acquaintanceship he was a pithy talker and his sermons bore marks of his own composition it's true they must have been already old when i began to listen to them and they were no more than a year's supply so that they recurred as regularly as the collects but though this system has been much ridiculed i am prepared to defend it as equally sound with that of a liturgy and even if my researches had shown me that some of my father's yearly sermons had been copied out from works of elder divines this would only have been another proof of his good judgment one may prefer fresh eggs though laid by a fowl of the meanest understanding but why fresh sermons nor can i be sorry though myself given to meditative if not active innovation that my father was a tory who had not exactly a dislike to innovators and dissenters but a slight opinion of them as persons of ill-founded self-confidence when my young years gathered many details concerning those who might perhaps have called themselves the more advanced thinkers in our nearest market town tending to convince me that their characters were quite as mixed as those of the thinkers behind them this circumstance of my rearing has at least delivered me from certain mistakes of classification which i observe in many of my superiors who have apparently no affectionate memories of a goodness mingled with what they now regard as outworn prejudices indeed my philosophical notions such as they are continually carry me back to the time when the fitful gleams of a spring day used to show me my own shadow as that of a small boy on a small pony riding by the side of a larger cob-mounted shadow over the breezy uplands which we used to dignify with the name of hills or along by-roads with broad grassy borders and hedgerows reckless of utility on our way to outlying hamlets whose groups of inhabitants were as distinctive to my imagination as if they had belonged to different regions of the globe from these we sometimes rode onward to the adjoining parish where also my father officiated for he was a pluralist but i hasten to add on the smallest scale for his one extra living was a poor vicarage with hardly fifty parishioners and its church would have made a very shabby barn the grey worm-eaten wood of its pews and pulpits with their doors only half hanging on the hinges being exactly the colour of a lean mouse which i once observed as an interesting member of the scant congregation 
and conjectured to be the identical church mouse i had heard referred to as an example of extreme poverty for i was a precocious boy and often reasoned after the fashion of my elders arguing that jack and jill were real personages in our parish and that if i could identify jack i should find on him the marks of a broken crown sometimes when i am in a crowded london drawing-room for i am a town bird now acquainted with smoky eaves and tasting nature in the parks quick flights of memory take me back among my father's parishioners while i am still conscious of elbowing men who wear the same evening uniform as myself and i presently begin to wonder what varieties of history lie hidden under the monotony of aspect some of them perhaps belong to families with many quarterings but how many quarterings of diverse contact with their fellow countrymen enter into these qualifications to be parliamentary leaders professors of social science or journalistic guides of the popular mind not that i feel myself a person made competent by experience on the contrary i argue that since an observation of different ranks has still left me practically a poor creature what must be the condition of those who object even to read about the life of other british classes than their own but of my elbowing neighbours with their crushed hats i usually imagine that the most distinguished among them have probably had a far more instructive journey into manhood than my own here perhaps is a thought-worn physiognomy seeming at the present moment to be classed as a mere species of white cravat and swallowtail which may once like faraday's have shown itself in curiously dubious embryonic form leaning against a cottage lintel in small corduroys and hungrily eating a bit of brown bread and bacon there is a pair of eyes now too much wearied by the gaslight of public assemblies that once perhaps learned to read their native england through the same alphabet as mine not within the boundaries of an ancestral park never even being driven through the county town five miles off but among the midland villages and markets along by the tree-studded hedgerows and where the heavy barges seem in the distance to float mysteriously among the rushes and the feathered grass our vision both real and ideal has since then been filled with far other scenes among eternal snows and stupendous sun-scorched monuments of departed empires within the scent of the long orange groves and where the temple of neptune looks out over the siren haunted sea but my eyes at least have kept their early affectionate joy in our native landscape which is one deep root of our national life and language and i often smile at my consciousness that certain conservative prepossessions have mingled themselves for me with the influences of our midland scenery from the tops of the elms down to the buttercups and the little wayside vetches naturally enough that part of my father's prime to which he oftenest referred had fallen on the days when the great wave of political enthusiasm and belief in a speedy regeneration of all things had ebbed and the supposed millennial initiative of france was turning into a napoleonic empire the sway of an attila with a mouth speaking proud things in a jargon half revolutionary half roman men were beginning to shrink timidly from the memory of their own words and from the recognition of the fellowships they had formed ten years before and even reforming englishmen for the most part were willing to wait for the perfection of society if only they could keep their throats perfect and help to drive away the chief enemy of mankind from our coasts to my father's mind the noisy teachers of revolutionary doctrine were to speak mildly a variable mix of the fool and the scoundrel the welfare of the nation lay in a strong government which could maintain order and i was accustomed to hear him utter the word government in a tone that charged it with awe and made it part of my effective religion in contrast with the word rebel which seemed to carry the stamp of evil in its syllables and lit by the fact that satan was the first rebel made an argument dispensing with more detailed inquiry 
I gathered that our national troubles in the first two decades of the century were not at all due to the mistakes of our administrators, and that England, with its fine church and constitution, would have been exceedingly well off if every British subject had been thankful for what was provided and minded his own business. If, for example, numerous Catholics of that period had been aware how very modest they ought to be, considering they were Irish. The times, I heard, had often been bad, but I was constantly hearing of bad times as a name for actual evenings and mornings when the godfathers who gave them that name appeared to me remarkably comfortable. Altogether, my father's England seemed to me lovable, laudable, full of good men, and having good rulers from Mr. Pitt on to the Duke of Wellington, until he was for emancipating the Catholics. And it was so far from prosaic to me that I looked into it for a more exciting romance than such as I could find in my own adventures, which consisted mainly in fancied crises, calling for the resolute wielding of domestic swords and firearms against unapparent robbers, rioters, and invaders, who, it seemed, in my father's prime, had more chance of being real. The Morris dancers had not then dwindled to a ragged and almost vanished rout, owing the traditional name probably to the historic fancy of our superannuated groom. Also, the good old king was alive and well, which made all the difference, because I had no notion what he was and did, only understanding in general that if he had been still on the throne, he would have hindered everything that wise persons thought undesirable. Certainly that elder England, with its frankly saleable boroughs, so cheap compared with the seats obtained under the reformed method, and its boroughs kindly presented by noblemen desirous to encourage gratitudes, its prisons, with a miscellaneous company of felons and maniacs, and without any supply of water, its bloated, idle charities, its non-resident jovial clergy, its militia balloting, and above all its blank ignorance of what we, its posterity, should be thinking of it, has great differences from the England of today. Yet we discern a strong family likeness. Is there any country which shows at once as much stability and as much susceptibility to change as ours? Our national life is like that scenery which I early learned to love, not subject to great convulsions, but easily showing more or less delicate, sometimes melancholy, effects from minor changes. Hence our Midland Plains have never lost their familiar expression and conservative spirit for me, yet at every other mile since I first looked on them some sign of world-wide change, some new direction of human labor has wrought itself into what one may call the speech of the landscape in contrast with those grander and vaster regions of the earth which keep an indifferent aspect in the presence of men's toil and devices. What does it signify that a Lilliputian train passes over a viaduct amidst the abysses of the Apennines, or that a caravan, laden with a nation's offerings, creeps across the unresting sameness of the desert, or that a petty cloud of steam sweeps for an instant over the face of an Egyptian colossus, immovably submitting to its slow burial beneath the sand. But our woodlands and pastures, our hedge-parted cornfields and meadows, our bits of high common where we used to plant the windmills, our quiet little rivers here and there fit to turn a mill-wheel, our villages, along the old coach-roads, are all easily alterable lineaments that seem to make the face of our motherland sympathetic with the laborious lives of her children. She does not take their ploughs and wagons contemptuously, but rather makes every hovel and every sheepfold, every railed bridge or fallen tree-trunk, an agreeably noticeable incident, not a mere speck in the midst of unmeasured vastness, but a piece of our social history in pictorial writing. Our rural tracts, where no babble chimney scales the heavens, 
are without mighty objects to fill the soul with the sense of an outer world unconquerably aloof from our efforts the wastes are playgrounds and let us try to keep them such for the children's children who will inherit no other sort of domain the grasses and reeds nod to each other over the river but we have cut a canal close by the very heights laugh with corn in august or lift the plough team against the sky in september then comes a crowd of burly navvies with pickaxes and barrows and while hardly a wrinkle is made in the fading mother's face or a new curve of health in the blooming girls the hills are cut through or the breaches between them spanned we choose our level and the white steamed pennon flies along it but because our land shows this readiness to be changed all signs of permanence upon it raise a tender attachment instead of awe some of us at least love the scanty relics of our forests and are thankful if a bush is left of the old hedgerow a crumbling bit of wall where the delicate ivy-leaved toad flax hangs its light branches or a bit of grey thatch with patches of dark moss on its shoulder and a troop of grass stems on its ridge is a thing to visit and then the tiled roof of cottage and homestead of the long cowshed where generations of the milky mothers have stood patiently of the broad-shouldered barns where the old-fashioned flail once made resonant music while the watchdog barked at the timidly venturesome fowls making pecking raids on the outflying grain the roofs that have looked out from among the elms and walnut trees or beside the yearly group of hay and cornstacks or below the square stone steeple gathering their grey or ochre tinted lichens and their olive green mosses under all ministries let us praise the sober harmonies they give to our landscape helping to unite us pleasantly with the elder generations who tilled the soil for us before we were born and paid heavier and heavier taxes with much grumbling but without that deepest root of corruption the self-indulgent despair which cuts down and consumes and never plants but i check myself perhaps this england of my affections is half visionary a dream in which things are connected according to my well-fed lazy mood and not at all by the multitudinous links of graver sadder facts such as belong everywhere to the story of human labour well well the illusions that began for us when we were less acquainted with evil have not lost their value when we discern them to be illusions they feed the ideal better and in loving them still we strengthen the precious habit of loving something not visibly tangibly existent but a spiritual product of our visible tangible selves i cherish my childish loves the memory of that warm little nest where my affections were fledged since then i have learned to care for foreign countries for literatures foreign and ancient for the life of continental towns dozing round old cathedrals for the life of london half sleepless with eager thought and strife with indigestion or with hunger and now my consciousness is chiefly of the busy anxious metropolitan sort my system responds sensitively to the london weather signs political social literary and my bachelor's hearth is embedded where my much craning of head and neck i can catch sight of a sycamore in the square garden i belong to the nation of london why there have been many voluntary exiles in this world and probably in the very first exodus of the patriarchal aryans for i am determined not to fetch my examples from races whose talk is of uncles and no fathers some of those who sallied forth went for the sake of a loved companionship when they would willingly have kept sight of the familiar plains and of the hills to which they had first lifted up their eyes. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Theophrastus Such by George Eliot This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Josh Middledorf Chapter 3 How We Encourage Research 
the serene and beneficent goddess truth like other deities whose disposition has been too hastily inferred from that of the men who have invoked them can hardly be well pleased with much of the worship paid to her even in this milder age when the stake and the rack have ceased to form part of her ritual some cruelties still pass for service done in her honour no thumbscrew is used no iron boot no scorching of flesh but plenty of controversial bruising laceration and even lifelong maiming less than formerly but so long as this sort of truth worship has the sanction of a public that can often understand nothing in a controversy except personal sarcasm or slanderous ridicule it's likely to continue the sufferings of its victims are often as little regarded as those of the sacrificial pig offered in old time with what we now regard as a sad miscalculation of effects one such victim is my old acquaintance merman twenty years ago merman was a young man of promise a conveyancer with a practice which had certainly budded but like aaron's rod seemed not destined to proceed further in that marvellous activity meanwhile he occupied himself in miscellaneous periodical writings and in a multifarious study of moral and physical science what chiefly attracted him in all subjects were the vexed questions which have the advantage of not admitting the decisive proof or disproof that renders many ingenious arguments superannuated not that merman had a wrangling disposition he put all his doubts queries and paradoxes deferentially contented without unpleasant heat and only with a sonorous eagerness against the personality of homer expressed himself civilly though firmly on the origin of language and had tact enough to drop at the right moment such subjects as the ultimate reduction of the so-called elementary substances his own total scepticism concerning manetheo's chronology or even the relation between the magnetic condition of the earth and the outbreak of revolutionary tendencies such flexibility was naturally much helped by his amiable feeling towards women whose nervous system he was convinced would not bear the continuous strain of difficult topics and also by his willingness to contribute a song whenever the same desultory charmer proposed music indeed his tastes were domestic enough to beguile him into marriage when his resources were still very moderate and partly uncertain his friends wished that so ingenious and agreeable a fellow might have more prosperity than they ventured to hope for him their chief regret on his account being that he did not concentrate his talent and leave off forming opinions on at least half a dozen of the subjects over which he scattered his attention especially now that he had married a nice little woman the generic name for acquaintances wives when they are not markedly disagreeable he could not they observed want all his various knowledge and laputian ideas for his periodical writing which brought him most of his bread and he would do well to use his talent in getting a specialty that would fit him for a post perhaps these well-disposed persons were a little rash in presuming that fitness for a post would be the surest ground for getting it and on the whole in now looking back on their wishes for merman their chief satisfaction must be that those wishes did not contribute to the actual result for in an evil hour merman did concentrate his attention he had for many years taken into his interest the comparative history of the ancient civilizations but it had not preoccupied him so as to narrow his generous attention to everything else one sleepless night however his wife was more than once narrated to me the details of an event memorable to her as the beginning of her sorrows after spending some hours over the epoch-making work of grampus a new idea seized him with regard to the possible connection of certain symbolic monuments common to widely scattered races merman started up in bed the night was cold and the sudden withdrawal of warmth made his wife first dream of a snowball and then cry what is the matter proteus a great matter julia that fellow grampus whose book is cried up as a revelation is all wrong about the macrocodumbras and the zuzumotzis and i have got hold of the right clue 
Good gracious, does it matter so much? Don't drag the clothes, dear. It signifies this, Julia, that if I am right, I shall set the world right. I shall regenerate history. I shall win the mind of Europe to a new version of social origins. I shall bruise the head of many superstitions. Oh, no, dear, don't go too far into things. Lie down again. You, you have been dreaming. What are the magicojumbras and tzutzitzotsums? I never heard you talk of them before. What use can it be troubling yourself with such things? That is the way, Julia, that is the way wives alienate their husbands and make any hearth pleasanter to him than his own. What do you mean, Proteus? Why, if a woman will not try to understand her husband's ideas, or at least to believe that they are of more value than she can understand, if she is to join anybody who happens to be against him, and suppose he is a fool because others contradict him, there is an end of our happiness. That is all I have to say. Oh, no, Proteus, dear, I do believe what you say is right. That is my only guide. I am sure I never have any opinions in any other way. I mean, about subjects. Of course, there are many little things that would tease you that you like me to judge of for myself. I know I said once that I did not want you to sing O oh, Ruttier Than the Cherry, because it was not in your voice, but I cannot remember ever differing from you about subjects. I never in my life thought anyone cleverer than you. Julia Merman was really a nice little woman, not one of the stately Dianes sometimes spoken of in those terms. Her black silhouette had a very infantine aspect, but she had discernment and wisdom enough to act on the strong hint of that memorable conversation, never again giving her husband the slightest ground for suspecting that she thought treasonably of his ideas in relation to the magic odombras and zutumotsis, or in the least relaxed her faith in his infallibility because Europe was not also convinced of it. It was well for her that she did not increase her troubles in this way, but to do her justice, what she was chiefly anxious about was to avoid increasing her husband's troubles. Not that these were great in the beginning. In the first development and writing out of his scheme, Merman had a more intense kind of intellectual pleasure than he had ever known before. His face became more radiant, his general view of human prospects more cheerful, Foreseeing the truth as presented by himself would win the recognition of his contemporaries, he excused with much liberality their rather rough treatment of other theorists whose basics was less perfect. His own periodical criticisms had never before been so amiable. He was sorry for that unlucky majority whom the spirit of the age or some other prompting more definite and local, compelled to write without any particular ideas. The possession of an original theory, which has not yet been assailed, must certainly sweeten the temper of a man who is not beforehand ill-natured, and Merman was the reverse of ill-natured. But the hour of publication came, and to half a dozen persons described as the learned world of two hemispheres, it became known that Grampus was attacked. This might have been a small matter, for who or what on earth that is good for anything is not assailed by ignorance, stupidity, or malice, and sometimes even by just objection? But on examination it appeared that the attack might possibly be held damaging, unless the ignorance of the author were well exposed and his pretended facts shown to be chimeras of that remarkably hideous kind, begotten by imperfect learning on the more feminine element of original incapacity. Grampus himself did not immediately cut open the volume which Merman had been careful to send him, not without a very lively and shifting conception of the possible effects which the explosive gift might produce on the too eminent scholar effects that must certainly have set in on the third day from the dispatch of the parcel. But in point of fact, Grampus knew nothing of the book until his friend Lord Norwall 
sent him an american newspaper containing a spirited article by the well-known professor sperm n whale which was rather equivocal in its bearing the passages quoted from merman being of a rather telling sort and the paragraphs which seemed to blow defiance being unaccountably feeble coming from so distinguished a cetacean then by another post arrived letters from Butzkopf and Dugong, both men whose signatures were familiar to the Teutonic world in the Zetzen Erzeichenten Monatschrief, or Hayrick for this insertion of split hairs, asking their master whether he meant to take up the combat, because, in the contrary case, both were ready. Thus America and Germany were roused, though England was still drowsy and it seemed time now for grampus to find merman's book under the heap and cut it open for his own part he was perfectly at ease about his system but this is a world in which the truth requires defence and specious falsehood must be met with exposure grampus having once looked through the book no longer wanted any urging to write the most crushing of replies this and nothing less than this was due from him to the cause of sound inquiry and the punishment would cost him little pains in three weeks from that time the palpitating merman saw his book announced in the programme of the leading review no need for grampus to put his signature who else had his vast yet microscopic knowledge who else his power of epithet this article in which merman was pilloried and as good as mutilated for he was shown to have neither ear nor nose for the subtleties of philological and archaeological study was much read and more talked about not because of any interest in the system of grampus or any precise conception of the danger attending lax views of the magicodumbras and zuzumotsis but because the sharp epigrams with which the victim was lacerated and the soaring fountains of acrid mud which were shot upward and poured over the fresh wounds, were found amusing in recital. A favorite passage was one in which a certain kind of sciolist was described as a creature of the walrus kind, having a phantasmal resemblance to higher animals when seen by ignorant minds in the twilight, dabbling or hobbling in it first one element and then the other, without parts or organs suited to either. In fact, one of nature's impostors who could not be said to have any artful pretenses since a congenital incompetence to all precisions of aim and movement made their every action a pretense just as a being born in doe-skin gloves would necessarily pass a judgment on surfaces but we all know what his judgment would be worth in drawing-room circles and for the immediate hour this ingenious comparison was so damaging as the showing of merman's mistakes and the mere smattering of linguistic and historical knowledge which he had presumed to be a sufficient basis for theorizing but the more learned cited his blunders aside to each other and laughed the laugh of the initiated in fact merman's was a remarkable case of sudden notoriety in london drums and clubs he was spoken of abundantly as one who had written ridiculously about the magicodumbras and zuzumotsis the leaders of conversation whether christians jews infidels or any other confession except the confession of ignorance pronouncing him shallow and indiscreet if not presumptuous and absurd he was heard of at warsaw and even paris took knowledge of him monsieur cachelot had not read either grampus or merman but he had heard of their dispute in time to insert a paragraph upon it in his brilliant work l'orient au point de vue actuel in which he was dispassionate enough to speak of grampus as possessing a coup d'oeil presque frangé in matters of historical interpretation and of merman as nevertheless an objector qui mérite d'être connu Monsieur Pompès, also availing himself of M. Cachelot's knowledge, reproduced it in an article with certain additions, which it is only fair to distinguish as his own, implying that the vigorous English of Grampus was not always as correct as a Frenchman could desire, 
while Merman's objections were more sophistical than solid. Presently, indeed, there appeared an able extrait of Grampus's article in the valuable Rapporteur scientifique et historique, and Merman's mistakes were thus brought under the notice of certain Frenchmen who were among the masters of those who know on ancient Oriental subjects. In a word, Merman, though not extensively read, was extensively read about. Meanwhile, how did he like it? Perhaps nobody, except his wife, for a moment reflected on that. An amused society considered that he was severely punished, but did not take the trouble to imagine his sensations. Indeed, this would have been a difficulty for persons less sensitive and excitable than Merman himself. Perhaps that popular comparison of the walrus had truth enough to bite and blister on thorough application, even if exultant ignorance had not applauded it. But it is well known that the walrus, though not in the least a malignant animal, if allowed to display its remarkably plain person and blundering performances at ease in any element it chooses, becomes desperately savage and musters alarming auxiliaries when attacked or hurt. In this characteristic, at least, Merman resembled the walrus, and now he concentrated himself with a vengeance. That his counter-theory was fundamentally the right one, he had a genuine conviction, whatever collateral mistakes he might have committed, and his bread would not cease to be bitter to him until he had convinced his contemporaries that Grampus had used his minute learning as a dust cloud to hide sophistical evasions, that in fact minute learning was an obstacle to clear-sighted judgment, more especially with regard to the Magicodumbras and Zuzumotsis, and that the best preparation in this matter was a wide survey of history and a diversified observation of men. Still, Merman was resolved to muster all the learning within his reach, and he wandered day and night through many wildernesses of German print. He tried compendious methods of learning Oriental tongues, and, so to speak, getting at a marrow of languages independently of their bones, for the chance of finding details to corroborate his own views, or possibly even to detect Grampus in some oversight or textual tampering. All other work was neglected. Rare clients were sent away, and amazed editors found this maniac indifferent to his chances of getting book parcels from them. It was many months before Merman had satisfied himself that he was strong enough to face round upon his adversary, but at last he had prepared sixty condensed pages of eager argument, which seemed to him worthy to rank with the best models of controversial writing. He had acknowledged his mistakes, but had restated his theory so as to show that it was left intact in spite of them. And he even found cases in which Zephius, Microps, Scrag Whale the Explorer, and other cetaceans of unanswerable authority were decidedly at issue with Grampus, especially a passage cited by this last from the greatest of fossils, Megalosaurus, was demonstrated by Merman to be capable of three different interpretations, all preferable to that chosen by Grampus, who took the words in their most literal sense for, one, the incomparable Saurian, alike unequalled in close observation and far-glancing comprehensiveness, might have meant those words ironically. Two, Motsi's was probably a false reading for Potsi's, in which case its bearing was reversed. And three, it is known that in the age of Saurians, there were conceptions about the Motsi's which entirely removed it from the category of things comprehensible in an age when Saurians run ridiculously small all which views were godfathered by names quite fit to be ranked with that of Grampus. In fine, Merman wound up his rejoinder by sincerely thanking the eminent adversary, without whose fierce assault he might not have undertaken a revision in the course of which he had met with unexpected and striking confirmations of his own fundamental views. Evidently Merman's anger was at white heat. The rejoinder being complete, all that remained was to find a suitable medium for its publication. This was not so easy. Distinguished mediums would not lend themselves to contradictions of Grampus, or if they would, 
Merman's article was too long and too abstruse, while he would not consent to leave anything out of an article which had no superfluities. For all this happened years ago, when the world was at a different stage. At last, however, he got his rejoinder printed, and not on hard terms, since the medium, in every sense modest, did not ask him to pay for its insertion. But if Merman expected to call out Grampus again, he was mistaken. Everybody felt it too absurd that Merman should undertake to correct Grampus in matters of erudition, and an eminent man has something else to do than to refute a petty objector twice over. What was essential had been done. The public had been enabled to form a true judgment of Merman's incapacity. The magic odumbras and the Zutumosis were but subsidiary elements in Grampus's system, and Merman might now be dealt with by younger members of the master's school. But he had at least the satisfaction of finding that he had raised a discussion which would not be let die. The followers of Grampus took it up with an ardor and an industry of research worthy of their exemplar. Butzkopf made it the subject of an elaborate Einleitung through his important work Die Bedeutung des Egetischen Labyrinthes and Dugong, in a remarkable address which he delivered to a learned society in Central Europe, introduced Merman's theory with so much power of sarcasm that it became a theme of more or less derisive allusion to men of many tongues. Merman, with his magic odumbras and zutumotis, was on the way to become a proverb, being used illustratively by many able journalists who took those names of questionable things to be Merman's own invention. Than which, said one of the graver guides, we can recall few more melancholy examples of speculative aberration. Naturally, the subject passed into popular literature and figured very commonly in advertised programs. The fluent Loligo, the formidable Shark, and a younger member of his remarkable family known as S. Catullus, made a special reputation by their numerous articles, eloquent, lively, or abusive, all on the same theme, under titles ingeniously varied, alliterative, sonorous, or boldly fanciful, such as Moments with Mr. Merman, Mr. Merman and the Magic Odumbras, Greenland Grampus and Proteus Merman, Grampian Heights and their Climbers, or the New Excelsior. They tossed him on short sentences. They swathed him in paragraphs of winding imagery. They found him at once a mere plagiarist and a theorizer of unexampled perversity, ridiculously wrong about Pozzi's and ignorant of Polly. They hinted, indeed, at certain things which to their knowledge he had silently brooded over in his boyhood and seemed tolerably well assured that this preposterous attempt to gainsay an incomparable cetacean of world-wide fame had its origin in a peculiar mixture of bitterness and eccentricity which, rightly estimated and seen in its definitive proportions, would furnish the best key to his argumentation. All alike were sorry for Merman's lack of sound learning, but how could their readers be sorry? Sound learning would not have been amusing, and as it was, Merman was made to furnish these readers with amusement at no expense of trouble on their part. Even burlesque writers looked into his books to see where it could be made use of, and those who did not know him were desirous of meeting him at dinner as one likely to feed their comic vein. On the other hand, he made a serious figure in sermons under the name of Some or Others, who had attempted presumptuously to scale eminences too high and arduous for human ability, and had given an example of ignominious failure edifying to the humble Christian. All this might be very advantageous for able persons whose superfluous fund of expression needed a paying investment but the effect on Merman himself was unhappily not so transient as the busy writing and speaking of which he had become the occasion. His certainty that he was right 
naturally got stronger in proportion as the spirit of resistance was stimulated. The scorn and unfairness with which he had felt himself to have been treated by those really competent to appreciate his ideas had galled him and made a chronic sore, and the exultant chorus of the incompetent seemed a pouring of vinegar on his wound. His brain became a registry of the foolish and ignorant objections made against him, and of continually amplified answers to these objections. Unable to get his answers printed, he had recourse to that more primitive mode of publication, oral transmission or buttonholing, now generally regarded as a troublesome survival, and the once pleasant, flexible merman was on the way to be shunned as a bore. His interest in new acquaintances turned chiefly on the possibility that they would care about the Magicodombras and Zuzumoses, that they would listen to his complaints and exposures of unfairness, and not only accept copies of what he had written on the subject, but send him appreciative letters in acknowledgment. Repeated disappointment of such hopes tended to embitter him, and not the less because after a while the fashion of mentioning him died out, allusions to his theory were less understood, and people could only pretend to remember it, and all the while Merman was perfectly sure that his very opponents, who had knowledge enough to be capable judges, were aware that his book, whatever errors of statement they might detect in it, had served as a sort of divining rod, pointing out hidden sources of historical interpretation. Nay, his jealous examination discerned in a new work by Grampus himself a certain shifting of ground which, so poor Merman declared, was the sign of an intention gradually to appropriate the views of the man he had attempted to brand as an ignorant impostor. And Julia, and the housekeeping, the rent, food, and clothing, which controversy can hardly supply, unless it be of the kind that serves as a recommendation to certain posts. Controversial pamphlets have been known to earn large plums, but nothing of the sort could be expected from unpractical heresies about the Magicodumbras and Zutumoses. Painfully the contrary. Merman's reputation as a sober thinker, a safe writer, a sound lawyer, was irretrievably injured. The distractions of controversy had caused him to neglect useful editorial connections, and indeed his dwindling care for miscellaneous subjects made his contributions too dull to be desirable. Even if he could now have given a new turn to his concentration, and applied his talents so as to be ready to show himself an exceptionally qualified lawyer, he would only have been, like an architect in competition, too late with his superior plans. He would not have had an opportunity of showing his qualification. He was thrown out of the course. The small capital which had filled up deficiencies of income was almost exhausted, and Julia, in the effort to make supplies equal to wants, had to use much ingenuity in diminishing the wants. The brave and affectionate woman, whose small outline, so unimpressive against an illuminated background, held within it a good share of feminine heroism, did her best to keep up the charm of home and soothe her husband's excitement, parting with the best jewel among her wedding presents in order to pay rent, without ever hinting to her husband that this sad result had come of his undertaking to convince people who only laughed at him. She was a resigned little creature, and reflected that some husbands took to drinking, others to forgery, Hers had only taken to magic or and zuzumotsis, and was not unkind, only a little more indifferent to her and the two children than she had expected he would be, his mind being eaten up with subjects, and constantly a little angry, not with her, but with everybody else, especially those who were celebrated. This was the sad truth. Merman felt himself ill-used by the world, and thought very much worse of the world in consequence. The gall of his adversary's ink had been sucked into his system and ran in his blood. He was still in the prime of life, but his mind was aged by that eager monotonous construction 
which comes of feverish excitement on a single topic and uses up the intellectual strength. Merman had never been a rich man, but he was now conspicuously poor and in need of the friends who had power or interest which he believed they could exert on his behalf. Their omitting or declining to give this help could not seem to him so clearly as to them an inevitable consequence of his having become impracticable, or at least of his passing for a man whose views were not likely to be safe and sober. Each friend, in turn, offended him, though unwillingly, and was suspected of wishing to shake him off. It was not altogether so, but poor Merman's society had undeniably ceased to be attractive, and it was difficult to help him. At last the pressure of want urged him to try for a post far beneath his earlier prospects, and he gained it. He holds it still, for he has no vices, and his domestic life has kept up a sweetening current of motive around and within him. Nevertheless, the bitter flavor, mingling itself with all topics, the premature weariness and withering, are irrevocably there. It is as if he had gone through a disease which alters what we call the constitution. He has long ceased to talk eagerly of the ideas which possess him, or to attempt making proselytes. The dial has moved onward, and he himself sees many of his former guesses in a new light. On the other hand, he has seen what he foreboded, that the main idea which was at the root of his too rash theorizing has been adopted by Grampus, and received with general respect, no reference being heard to the ridiculous figure this important conception made when ushered in by the incompetent others. Now and then, on rare occasions when a sympathetic tete-a-tete has restored some of his old expansiveness, he will tell a companion in a railway carriage or other place of meeting favorable to autobiographical confidences what has been the course of things in his particular case, as an example of the justice to be expected of this world. The companion usually allows for the bitterness of a disappointed man, and is secretly disinclined to believe that Grampus was to blame. End of chapter 3 of Theophrastus Such. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 of Impressions of Theophrastus Such by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Josh Middledorf. Chapter 4 A Man Surprised at His Originality. Among the many acute sayings of La Rochefoucauld, there is hardly one more acute than this. La plus grande ambition n'en a pas la moindre apparence lorsqu'elle se rencontre dans une impossibilité absolue d'arriver où elle aspire. Translated by your reader as The greatest of ambitions count for nothing when they encounter an impossibility of realization. Some of us might do well to use this hint in our treatment of acquaintances and friends from whom we are expecting gratitude because we are so very kind in thinking of them, inviting them, and even listening to what they say, considering how insignificant they must feel themselves to be. We are often fallaciously confident in supposing that our friend's state of mind is appropriate to our moderate estimate of his importance almost as if we imagined the humble mollusk, so useful an illustration, to have a sense of his own exceeding softness and low place in the scale of being. Your mollusk, on the contrary, is inwardly objecting to every other grade of solid rather than to himself. Accustomed to observe what we think an unwarrantable conceit exhibiting itself in ridiculous pretensions and forwardness to play the lion's part, in obvious self-complacency and loud peremptoriness, we are not on the alert to detect the egoistic claims of a more exorbitant kind often hidden under an apparent neutrality or an acquiescence in being put out of the question. Thoughts of this kind occurred to me yesterday 
when I saw the name of Lentulus in the obituary. The majority of his acquaintances, I imagine, have always thought of him as a man justly unpretending, and as nobody's rival. But some of them have perhaps been struck with surprise at his reserve in praising the works of his contemporaries, and have now and then felt themselves in need of a key to his remarks on men of celebrity in various departments. He was a man of fair position, deriving his income from a business in which he did nothing, at leisure, to frequent clubs and at ease in giving dinners, well-looking, polite, and generally acceptable in society, as a part of what we may call its breadcrumb, the neutral basis needful for the plums and spice. Why, then, did he speak of the modern Maro or the French Flaccus, with a peculiarity in his tone of assent to other people's praise which might almost have led you to suppose that the eminent poet had borrowed money of him and shown an indisposition to repay. He had no criticism to offer, no sign of objection more specific than a slight cough, a scarcely perceptible pause before assenting, and an air of self-control in his utterance, as if certain considerations had determined him not to inform against the so-called poet, who, to his knowledge, was a mere versifier. If you had questioned him closely, he would perhaps have confessed that he did think something better might be done in the way of eclogues and georgics, or of odes and epodes, and that to his mind poetry was something very different from what had hitherto been known under that name. For my own part, being of a superstitious nature, given readily to imagine alarming causes, I immediately, on first getting these mystic hints from Lentulus, concluded that he held a number of entirely original poems, or at the very least a revolutionary treatise on poetics, in that melancholy manuscript state to which works excelling all that is ever printed are necessarily condemned. And I was long timid in speaking of the poets when he was present, for what might not Lentulus have done or be profoundly aware of that would make my ignorant impressions ridiculous? One cannot well be sure of the negative in such a case, except through certain positives that bear witness to it, and those witnesses are not always to be got hold of. But time wearing on, I perceived that the attitude of Lentulus toward the philosophers was essentially the same as his attitude toward the poets. Nay, there was something so much more decided in his mode of closing his mouth after a brief speech on the former. There was such an air of rapt consciousness in his private hints as to his conviction that all thinking hitherto had been an elaborate mistake, and so to his own power of conceiving a sound basis for a lasting superstructure, that I might begin to believe less in the poetical stores and to infer that the line of Lentulus lay rather in the rational criticism of our beliefs and in systematic construction. In this case I did not figure to myself the existence of formidable manuscripts ready for the press, for great thinkers are known to carry their theories growing within their minds long before committing them to paper, and the ideas which made a new passion for them when their locks were jet or auburn remain perilously unwritten an inwardly developing condition of their successive selves, until the locks are grey or scanty. I only meditated improvingly on the way in which a man of exceptional faculties, and even carrying within him some of that fierce refiner's fire which is to purge away the dross of human error, may move about in society totally unrecognized, regarded as a person whose opinion is superfluous, and only rising into a power in emergencies of threatened blackballing. Imagine a Descartes, or a Locke, being recognized for nothing more than a good fellow and a perfect gentleman. What a painful view does such a picture suggest of impenetrable dullness in the society around them. I would at all times rather be reduced to a cheaper estimate of a particular person if by that means I can get a more cheerful view of my fellow men generally, and I confess that in a certain curiosity which led me to cultivate Lentulus's acquaintance, 
my hope leaned to the discovery that he was a less remarkable man than he had seemed to imply. It would have been a grief to discover that he was bitter or malicious, but by finding him to be neither a mighty poet, nor a revolutionary poetical critic, nor an epoch-making philosopher, my admiration for the poets and thinkers whom he rated so low would recover all its buoyancy, and I should not be left to trust to that very suspicious sort of merit which constitutes an exception in the history of mankind, and recommends itself as the total abolitionist of all previous claims on our confidence. You are not greatly surprised at the infirm logic of the coachman who would persuade you to engage him by insisting that any other would be sure to rob you in the matter of hay and corn, thus demanding a difficult belief in him as the sole exception from the frailties of his calling. But it is rather astonishing that the wholesale decriers of mankind and its performances should be even more unwary in their reasoning than the coachman since each of them not merely confides in your regarding himself as an exception, but overlooks the almost certain fact that you are wondering whether he inwardly accepts you. Now, conscious of entertaining some common opinions which seemed to fall under the mildly intimated but sweeping ban of Lentulus, my self-complacency was a little concerned. Hence I deliberately attempted to draw out Lentulus in private dialogue, for it is the reverse of injury to a man to offer him that hearing which he seems to have found nowhere else. And for whatever purposes silence may be equal to gold, it cannot be safely taken as an indication of specific ideas. I sought to know why Lentulus was more than indifferent to the poets, and what was that new poetry which he had either written or, as to its principles, distinctly conceived but I presently found that he knew very little of any particular poet, and had a general notion of poetry as the use of artificial language to express unreal sentiments. He instanced the Gior, La La Rook, The Pleasures of Hope, and Ruin Seizes Thee, Ruthless King, adding, and plenty more, on my observing that he probably preferred a larger, simpler style he emphatically assented. "'Have you not,' said I, "'written something of that order?' "'No, but I often compose as I go along. I see how things might be written as fine as Ossian, only with true ideas. The world has no notion what poetry will be.' It was impossible to disprove this, and I am always glad to believe that the poverty of our imagination is no measure of the world's resources." Our posterity will no doubt get fuel in ways that we are unable to devise for them. But what this conversation persuaded me of was that the birth with which the mind of Lentulus was pregnant could not be poetry, though I did not question that he composed as he went along, and that the exercise was accompanied with a great sense of power. This is a frequent experience in dreams, and much of our waking experience is but a dream in the daylight. Nay, for what I saw, the compositions might fairly classed as oceanic. But I was satisfied that Lentulus could not disturb my grateful admiration for the poets of all ages by eclipsing them or by putting them under a new electric light of criticism. Still, he had himself thrown the chief emphasis of his protest and his conscientiousness of corrective illumination on the philosophic thinking of our race, and his tone in assuring me that everything which had been done in that way was wrong, that Plato, Robert Owen, and Dr. Tufel, who wrote in The Regulator, were all equally mistaken, gave my superstitious nature a thrill of anxiety. After what had passed about the poets, it did not seem likely that Lentulus had all systems by heart. But who could say he had not seized that thread which may somewhere hang out loosely from the web of things and be the clue of unravelment? We need not go far to learn that a prophet is not made by erudition. Lentulus, at least, had not the bias of a school, and if it turned out that he was in agreement with any celebrated thinker, ancient or modern, 
the agreement would have the value of an undesigned coincidence not due to forgotten reading it was therefore with renewed curiosity that i engaged him on this large subject the universal erroneousness of thinking up to the period when lentulus began that process and here i found him more copious than on the theme of poetry he admitted that he did contemplate writing down his thoughts but his difficulty was their abundance apparently he was like the woodcutter entering the thick forest and saying where shall i begin the same obstacle appeared in a minor degree to cling about his verbal exposition and accounted perhaps for his rather helter-skelter choice of remarks bearing on the number of unaddressed letters sent to the post-office on what logic really is as tending to support the buoyancy of human mediums and mahogany tables on the probability of all miracles under all religions when explained by hidden laws and my unreasonableness in supposing that their profuse occurrence at half a guinea an hour in recent times was anything more than a coincidence on the haphazard way in which marriages are determined showing the baselessness of social and moral schemes and on his expectation that he should offend the scientific world when he told them what he thought of electricity as an agent no man's appearance could be graver or more gentlemanlike than that of lentulus as we walked along the mall where he delivered these observations understood by himself to have a regenerative bearing on human society his wristbands and black gloves his hat and nicely clipped hair his laudable moderation in beard and his evident discrimination in choosing his tailor all seemed to excuse the prevalent estimate of him as a man untainted with heterodoxy and likely to be so unencumbered with opinions that he would always be useful as an assenting and admiring listener men of science seeing him at their lectures doubtless flattered themselves that he came to learn from them the philosophic ornaments of our time expounding some of their luminous ideas in the social circle took the meditative gaze of lentulus for one of surprise not unmixed with a just reverence at such close reasoning towards so novel a conclusion and those who were called men of the world considered him a good fellow who might be asked to vote for a friend of their own and would have no troublesome notions to make him unaccommodating you perceive how very much they were all mistaken except in qualifying him as a good fellow this lentulus certainly was in the sense of being free from envy hatred and malice and such freedom was all the more remarkable an indication of native benignity because of his gaseous illimitably expansive conceit yes conceit for that his enormous and contentedly ignorant confidence in his own rambling thoughts was usually clad in a decent silence is no reason why it should be less strictly called by the name directly implying a complacent self-estimate unwarranted by performance nay the total privacy in which he enjoyed his consciousness of inspiration was the very condition of its undisturbed placid nourishment and gigantic growth your audibly arrogant man exposes himself to tests in attempting to make an impression on others he may possibly not always be made to feel his own lack of definiteness and the demand for definiteness is to all of us a needful check on vague deprecation of what others do and vague ecstatic trust in our own superior ability but lentulus was at once so unreceptive and so little gifted with the power of displaying his miscellaneous deficiency of information that there was really nothing to hinder his astonishment at the spontaneous crop of ideas which his mind secretly yielded if it occurred to him that there were more meanings than one for the word motive since it sometimes meant the end aimed at and sometimes the feeling that prompted the aiming and that the word cause was also of changeable import he was naturally struck with the truth of his own perception and was convinced that if this vein were well followed much might be made of it men were evidently in the wrong about cause and effect else why was society in this confused state we behold and as to motive lentulus felt that when he came to write down his views 
he should look deeply into this kind of subject and show up thereby the anomalies of our social institutions meanwhile the various aspects of motive and cause flitted about among the motley crowd of ideas which he regarded as original and pregnant with reformative efficacy for his unaffected good will made him regard all his insight as only valuable because it tended toward reform the respectable man had got into his illusory maze of discoveries by letting go that clue of conformity in his thinking which he had kept fast hold of in his tailoring and manners he regarded heterodoxy as a power in itself and took his inacquaintance with doctrines for a creative dissonance but his epitaph needs not be a melancholy one his benevolent disposition was more effective for good than his silent presumption for harm he might have been mischievous but for the lack of words instead of being astonished at his inspirations in private he might have clad his addled originalities disjointed commonplaces blind denials and balloon-like conclusions in that mighty sort of language which would have made a new koran for a knot of followers i mean no disrespect to the ancient koran but one would not desire the rock to lay more eggs and give us a whole wing-flapping brood to soar and make twilight peace be with lentulus for he has left us in peace blessed is the man who having nothing to say abstains from giving us wordy evidence of the fact from calling on us to look through a heap of millet seed in order to be sure that there is no pearl in it end of chapter four of impressions of theophrastus such